Costa Brava, Lebanon. This is the North American premiere. You're in Toronto. You're coming from Venice. You had a screening there. I believe a couple of screenings there. Um, but I want to go to the genesis of... Uh, I want to go a part of the timeline where um, if you had gone to a market uh, an hour before the blast in, in Beirut, the idea of, of living a traumatic event and some, somehow coming unscathed but being informed by it and it potentially adding something uh, of, of deeper meaning or depth to the actual production. Well, thank you for asking. <laughs> um, you know, we were all in the office when it happened, and the office is quite close to the Beirut port. So we went from, you know, brainstorming, and we were in the middle of an exciting meeting. We had just greenlit the pre-production to this moment that changed our lives forever where we're suddenly looking for each other under broken walls and rubble. And so I think um, after we took two months off to grieve our city and, and, and went back into pre-production, I realized as I was making the film and afterwards how much the trauma and, and that they actually informed not only the process of filming where we all felt we needed each other so it became a moment of community uh, it, like the shoot almost became group therapy for people who realized that they needed a reason to wake up in the morning and to uh, not be alone. So that was one thing that it brought to the shoot. I feel like I was even more tender than I usually would be as a director because uh, after what I went through, I felt like I didn't want to waste time anymore, you know? So I had less walls. Uh, I was closer to my actors, even though the pandemic made me physically farther. I felt more open to everyone because I was grateful to be alive. And in terms of how it informed the film and the story, um, the film was set in a dystopian future in 2030, where the country would ha had fallen apart. I just made the film set in 2020 because uh, the, the, the reality caught up with me and, and it was worse than the dystopia I had imagined. But also I think that the film always started with a shot of the port, even five years ago when I wrote it. And when I was discussing the shot list with my cinematographer, Joe, he, we thought, well, should we get rid of the shot? Because right now the port looks like... And we both said, well, no, well, that's the opening shot and that's Lebanon of today. And so that became the backstory of the film, that it happens after the explosion. And that uh, was adapted to how the characters saw themselves in their present. It made this family less um, it made the family less eccentric because there were no longer people who were escaping a reality that they could have stayed in but they were ex escaping today's reality in Lebanon so they're less of uh, unusual characters they're, they represent a bigger part of Lebanese people today mm -hmm. and with the makeup artist we added those uh, we wanted to find a way to express those scars that we were feeling as people but visually and so all the scars that the cast and crew had, like from the broken glass and from, we added it to the characters in the film to help them with their backstory. I was thinking a lot of this idea of abandonment and escapism or escape uh, in general. Um, it's like these three set communities where there's people that are fixed, embedded. Uh, the Badris, which used to be that, but now they're they're isolated in their own space they've escaped for whatever reasons for reasons of sanity but also to protect their family um, and then there's this whole other set of people that have been displaced physically outside of the the geological location or the the, the borders of the country so there's these three sets of of different mentalities if you will so um was one of your ideas when you're writing the screenplay obviously you're thinking of dystopian future but you're also thinking you're you're doing a critical examination of the people of perhaps even you in a way. Yes. Um, so I was wondering how that sort of like embedded itself in that idea. Where um, I think in this film you're not you're not pointing the finger, but you are being critical of this family in a way. Yes, I think I'm being critical of this family in the same way I'm being critical of myself because I think you know like in dreams you wake up and you realize that every character in your dream is a version of yourself I think every character in this family is a version of me and 
because um, in a way the character of the aunt who's moved to another country feels at home nowhere and everywhere. She feels unhappy wherever she is. She's not happy in Colombia, she's not happy in Lebanon. She feels like she's been displaced and has never found a way to root herself, even though she feels comfortable everywhere, but feels homeless everywhere as well. Mm -hmm. And I think she represents a big part of Lebanese people who wish so hard that they can find a home in Lebanon, but realize that for their own mental health and, and to have a future that has more dignity, they went elsewhere, even if elsewhere was um, uh, something that gave less opportunities in a way. I, and I think every character in this film is, dip, is displaced on some level because Suraya is in the mountains, but it's just a temporary escape because they have to protect their children from a reality that has been more painful and more and more painful every day. I think Lebanese people today feel like they have nowhere to go and wherever they are, they feel like they're in an open air prison. Mm -hmm. Like for example, I was the character of Reem because I was born the year the civil war ended. And my, I, I, for the first like 15 years of my life, there was no war, but I felt like I inherited the trauma of my parents, even though they never spoke about it at home. And so, uh, but then when, when the explosion happened, I felt like it all resurfaced because I had it in my body. Or for example, when I started writing the film, I felt like I was like Soraya, the mother. I was every day in the streets during the revolution, filled with hope and anger and thought that everything was possible. We were going to overthrow this corrupt government. But when I finished shooting the film, after I almost died in the explosion, I felt more like Walid, where I felt homeless and, and fearful and fragile and felt like uh, I had lost hope a little bit. And at the same time, I feel like sometimes as a young Lebanese girl, I felt trapped in a country that uh, says that it's like much more open than other Middle Eastern countries, but that really traps women's uh, desires in, in more subtle ways than in other places. And so I really feel like I was able to travel through different people I know, and different people of myself through this family, and. My criticism of them is my criticism of myself because in the end they're just trying to survive in a place that's just breaking their, their, their dreams. I, I wanted to say that the garbage pile up is the best thing that ever occurred to this family. Um, <laughs> and uh, Especially to the teenager. Especially to the teenager, but um, yeah, I like the idea of the youngest protagonist, how essentially she's the door, she's the, the exit uh, space or... Um, Mindset. Uh, she's the one that literally opens doors, unlocks locks, um, and I, I like how you um, get very specific POVs or DNAs to all of your character set. Um, and going back to something that you were saying, I, I thought you, you did a really great job at sound design. Um, there, there's a great shot, and I don't want to spoil it here, but it evokes an idea of what the past was for the for the matriarch of this family. Um, so, and, and sort of like the, the life that they escape and the life that they inherently miss. Um, I, I was wondering if you could discuss how you specifically wrote sound as a, in terms of memory in this, in yes. your text. I thought, you know, since I really wanted this film to be, because this family is, is trapped in a sense that they're living in nature, but in their mind they're living in Beirut because they haven't come to terms with what Beirut represents for them. And even Walid, who says that he doesn't want to go back there, loves it more than anyone, really. And I think it was really important for me when I wrote the film to try to find a way to write in sound the memory of what Beirut can be when you're displaced from Beirut. Whether you're in New York and Beirut is part of your everyday and you associate every sound with it, or in the case uh, of Costa Brava, the mother, played by Nadine Labaki, dreams of Beirut, so how do you incorporate the soundtrack of her memory in her present, which is birds and, you know. Mm -hmm. And the garbage uh, arrival, even though the garbage is not a metaphor because it is inspired by a real garbage crisis that happened in the country, what the garbage does it is, it, uh, is that it brings the memory of a city uh, or the curiosity of a city to the doors of this family that doesn't want to look at the past or at the present, really. So for the teenager, the arrival of the garbage is the reminder of a city she wants to discover, of a world she wants to discover. And for the mother, it's a reminder of a past she hasn't come to terms with because I feel like the ache I have when it comes to my relationship to Lebanon today is um, no doctor or no geographical change will heal that. And that's what I wanted to try to explore with the character of Nadine is 
how do you grieve a place that you haven't grieved? When I interviewed Nadine for Capernaum, I said, uh, you're, you're never going to give us another caramel. Uh, um, you're too politicized right now. You're too invested in, in whatever next causes that you're going to bring up. I could say the very much the same thing here with you. Um, your, your, your short films are politicized. Your, your docu elements are politicized. I, I, I have a feeling that we're not going to find a broad comedy in you, and, and <laughs> not anytime soon. How is it to, to bring on a filmmaker who I want to say in her right way is like legend status, at least in my eyes? How is it to have her involved as a player and to sort of like, you know, see a, a peer of yours, but also see her also flip the switch and, and be a full time player? How is that process? Uh, for you, like day one, you're directing a director, but you're directing a great actor as well. Yes, the, I think the day we realized we wanted to work together is the first day we had a coffee together and spoke about the character of Suraya. Because the conversation was really about her, about me, about our relationship to Lebanon. And it was just a conversation between two women. And it's on that day that I realized, I knew she was a good actress. And I knew she was smart enough not to bring the director on set. Because she's, uh, she's not the type of person that wants, I mean, she's, I knew that wouldn't be a problem. And I also grew up in the same street as her, so we're neighbors and we know of each other. Her, her husband's music studio is right below my childhood bedroom. So I kind of like, for, for a couple of years I was waking up and sleeping when I was a teenager on the editing of the soundtrack of Caramel and Where Do We Go Now? And probably she witnessed the soundtrack of my life without realizing. So we knew of each other, our energies you know, collided indirectly. So when we sat together, it was really just about the story I'm trying to tell. And she understood how personal it was to me and I understood how much she related to Soraya more than what I thought actually. And then on that day I left and I thought, Nadine's gonna be Soraya because the way she responded to the character I was writing mm -hmm. was the most important mm -hmm. thing to me. And so we didn't do a lot of rehearsals, Nadine and I. We just spoke a lot, spoke, 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 sat together, spoke. Sometimes she would call me and say, I feel like this is what Soraya would drink in the morning. And I'd be like, yeah. And, and I think that um, her professionalism is the reason why the director wasn't on set. So I felt that I was working with a great director, had a great connection with the character who I became friends with. And the advantage of her being a director was just that sometimes I had to speak less and she would really understand what I would mean. But the director in her was not on set with me. Uh, but her, her experience as a director made her really understand my cinematographer and I, and understand like what we were looking for without me having to explain much. Mm -hmm. And she knows her cues and she knows how to act with the non-actors. So yes. she's, she's like... A, she was really a, helpful actually because she's an actress who works with non-actors. She really helped the character of the kid. Sometimes she had improvised scenes with Reem, the kid who was played by twins who have never acted before. And she would encourage mistakes and take the mistakes and take them elsewhere. And there's a scene that probably people will notice that there was a mistake that we turned into something we kept in the film. It's my favorite moment in, in the scene. I won't spoil it. Okay. I was thinking a lot of the patriarch. I was like, I was thinking of a Fatih Akin film, a docu film. I was thinking also Mosquito uh, Mosquito Coast, the Harrison Ford film. Yeah. Like this patriarch takes his family and essentially they're shipwrecked in an, in their own bizarre way. But I, I, I thought I found it interesting how he's surrounded by an, a, a, an interior wall, which is this wall of women, and it's not by it's not an accident that you know he's surrounded by these four characters that are that are that that represent the past, the the, the now, and the future of of women, Lebanese women, strong yes. strong voices. So uh, I was wondering if you could discuss that that sort of like synergy that you created. Yes. So, you know, some people told me uh, that they felt like Walid was a bit too tough or too, you know, like uh, that sometimes they felt like um, uh, he didn't listen enough. And, and, you know, I grew up in a family where it was mostly women and my father was the only man. And so that's what I know. I didn't decide to write a film with one man and many women just because I was trying to make a statement. I, I write what I know and, and I think that Walid's 
greater, greatest arc throughout the film is that he learns how to listen to others. Because Walid is a character who has a lot of walls because he's been so hurt just by the fact that he's such an idealist and a that great romantic as well. He's been so hurt, but also Walid is um, the pure product of a patriarchal society. Mm -hmm. He might not be aware of it. Mm -hmm. And I think his journey that goes from him only listening to himself and to his fears, to him deciding to listening to others and to facing his fears is uh, as interesting as it would have been if he was a woman as well, you know? And But the fact that he's a man which is the product of a patriarchal society brings in certain elements to the story that I didn't try to push, but it's more like I write what my society is and what I know, and it's a society in which, in which um, uh, men have certain advantages that women don't have and some of them aren't even aware of, of it uh, and so I think that the female characters in the film um, serve as a mirror for him to realize a lot of things about how he was brought up mm -hmm. and, and him deciding to leave only when his little kid the new generation tells him it's time to go is a great act of love because it shows that he's understood a lot of things Great point. Yeah, and it's a, it's a. I, I love how you sort of like pair, you do pairings in this film, at least in the the third act, and and sort of like um, those lineages do exist. But it's it's really interesting how the the the, the how they're really fully realized characters. I I wasn't uh, I wasn't expecting how how you'd be able to like give the coming of age element to the to the to the teenage protagonist and for her to test her own limits and. Yeah, it's very much a film about limitations, borders, walls, and and yes. and um, so so I, I like how every single one sort of like decides um, th their comfort level and how they're gonna break down certain barriers and um, yeah, and the teenage character she really tests the limits of the world that because she's lived her whole life trying to please her father because her father unconsciously places her in a competition with her younger sister, which is like the pure product of his own utopia. And so Tala's arc, I think, in, in its silence as well, because she's a girl who um, feels like she cannot really speak at home, because she spent her life trying to please and, and she's idealized her father, idealized her mother, she wants to please her father, and what she does throughout the film is realize she doesn't want to please anyone anymore, she doesn't want to please her father, she wants to test her own limits, she wants to discover the real world, and her greatest moment is when she tells him, no, mm -hmm. I don't care if I please you or if I satisfy what you expect of me, this is what I want out of life, and I think this is also one of the moments that add to him realizing that he's maybe not listening enough to his daughters or to his wife or to himself yeah, and this actor uh, Saleh uh, Bakri he's a highly selective actor he doesn't he's very picky about his roles yes. he doesn't do television really that much is like his filmography since when I discovered him I think it was uh, uh, Hanny's film yes. a long time ago but I was I was like I was looking at his IMDB credits and I'm is very very selective yes. uh, so was it when you cast him does he go through a whole um, creative process and does he ask a lot of questions when you when you first approach him the thing about Sarah is that he's a really pure person that cares so much about cinema that he's very selective with his roles because he puts his heart and soul into a role and he's careful with his own energy as well and he functions on instinct as well. So when we met together at a film festival years ago, I was in competition with my short film and he was in the jury of the feature films. And he came to watch my short and, and we just fell in love with each other creatively. And we left the festival saying, we're gonna work together. And on that day I decided he was going to be Walid and I wrote the first description of the character of Walid in the script was deep blue eyes. And I never told him. I spent a year writing the script without telling him that he was going to be the character. And then one day I told him, you know you're the, you're the protagonist in my movie. And he says, I can't wait. And that was it. <laughs> nice story. And I think that like the reason why I thought he was perfect for the role is because, first of all, he knows what 
losing what you love most means because he's Palestinian and he knows what resistance is. He knows what um, not feeling like you belong anywhere anymore means. He knows what it feels like to be broken because your home has been taken away from you. He's also an idealist and he knows what it is to love something so much that it hurts. Mm -hmm. He's also um, uh, newly a father, so he he's a very tender man who's He's, he has been a paternal person even before he was a father, and he had he had so many so many things in common with the character that it felt so natural that he would be a Walid, and, and he did a lot of research to understand the Lebanese aspect also of things because of because it's a Lebanese character that he played. So not only he learned the accent and worked on it for a year, but he did he did a lot of research on what it means to be Lebanese and to be Walid, not just be. Saleh. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great to hear. Yeah. Um, and the little girls fell in love with him. So the obsession of the little girl with Walid it was natural. Like that kid, that those twins were completely in love with him. He's a good looking guy. That helps as well. Yeah, he's not, he's not very ugly. Hey, this is Eric from MyOwnCinema.com. If you want to support us, subscribe below. For more reviews, interviews, film festival coverage from Sundance, Cannes, Toronto, you want to check out these guys on this side.